Before I get started, I'd like to thank you for coming to uh, Lure and Ice Fishing. Uh, I'm Scott Olson. And before we get started, who all here has uh, is thinking about starting ice fishing or been out at least a couple times? That's good. Um, well, it's, it's good to see it. Uh, I, I got into it really hard about five years ago uh, working at Cabela's myself. And uh, from here, it started with a couple things, and from here, and for the last five years, it's grown uh, pretty much uh, every year with new, with new stuff, new toys, and whatnot. Um, but uh, first thing, first thing you do before you get started on ice fishing is that uh, safety is always the number one priority before you go ice fishing. Um, you want to know what the ice is going to be like. You want to make sure you've got some safety gear with you. Um, Even fish recommends at least minimum of four inches. You always hear people going through the ice. Well, usually, usually they're uh, going on less than less than that. Uh, uh, I, know, I know some people that do go out when there's about two inches of ice, but they do so only at their own uh, risk. Um, if you're going to an unfamiliar lake, you always want to make sure that you have um, ice picks that you wear around your neck, so in case you do fall through, you pull them out and you can get yourself out of the water, as well as wearing um, spikes on your boots. That can help you get a grip too if you need to use your, you know, if you're trying to climb out as well. So it's always important to have at least those two things as well. You can bring out the right foot on the ice. Um, but I mean, some people also bring, make sure you have a fishing buddy to, uh, it's always safest, especially on early ice, to go out with someone who can help you in case something should happen. And have a safety rope or something else to throw out. Um, there are a couple of uh, things you find at the store where it's just a rope inside of like a little bag you can just take out really quick. Just toss it out to them if they have somewhere to fall through the ice. This is just kind of a drawing, kind of diagram of the record about the fish recommends for your minimum, your minimum uh, just your thickness of ice for different things you want to do. Like four inches is the minimum that they recommend for just getting on the ice, and then from there, you want, you want to get on the water uh, with different size vehicles, and um, uh, whatnot. But yeah, so always. You know, always make sure, this time, this time of year, most of the lakes have all got at least a foot of ice or better. So you're usually pretty safe to go on about it like this time of year. But especially early in like this November, December, and in the uh, end of March. It's always best to uh, know, know the ice before you actually go out and we'll venture out to it. And first things first is with apparel. Now, pretty much any insulated coat, bibs, pants, warm boots are going to suffice. Uh, to be on the ice. You don't have to have you know the most expensive stuff. As long as it keeps you warm and dry, that's the most important thing. And it keeps the wind off of you. Um, windproof and waterproof features are better to have because you will get wet. And if the if stuff you have is warm or doesn't protect you from the wind a little bit, you will get chilly unless you have some other some sort of form of protection. Uh, the ice fishing suits like the uh, like clam ice armor suit and the frayville suits um, are probably your, are your best bets. If you don't have anything that doesn't have the windproof, waterproof feature, uh, you'd be surprised what you can stay out, or what you can stay out on on the ice when you have uh, one of these suits on. And of course, there are other there are other different there are different brands. You know, you can I mean, some people use their hunting clothes. They go out on the ice, and that works the same too. As long as it keeps you warm and dry, that's definitely the most important thing uh, to start with. And you need to get you need to get through the ice, obviously. So hand augers generally. Are the most economical one because they're you just want to get a hold of. They're the cheapest ones. Uh, they're they're best really for early and late ice when it's a little bit thinner. Uh, but some people do still use them when the ice is still thick. They just want they just want to drill you know 100 holes. They might just, they might just drill drill a few. They do how they are lightweight, which is nice for when you're hauling stuff out in the ice. They do require frequent blade sharpening a little bit though, and then the prices do range anywhere from 50 up to about 100. And $160 to $170, depending on the brand and the blade type. Some blades are a little better than others. Um, like the, uh, the Nils models tend to be kind of in the higher range. They have a little better, better blade on, don't require sharpening as much. And of course, you've got your, you know, your a lot of people use Strike Masters around here for their Moras and the laser models. Um, but those will work well too. Electric augers are quite really good. Just something that you had there, uh, six inches. Uh, if you're doing it by hand, Smaller is much harder. Yeah. 
And it's not, it's not just two inches harder, it's much harder. So. Exactly, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. The smaller blade is a lot easier to get through the ice than the bigger ones. I've seen guys who are doing 10 inch hands. It takes them forever to get through the ice. So it's always best to go with the six inch. If you don't, if you don't intend on getting anything more than a hand out hand or a star out with, it's best just to stick with about six inch, unless you're planning going for bigger fish. Um, lately, though, electric, <coughs> electric augers have really been kind of a big deal on the ice right now, thanks to uh, better and more efficient batteries that last a lot longer. Um, they're relatively lightweight. On um, this particular one here is the claim it's the new, new for the year, the claim conversion kit, and it weighs 12 pounds, runs off of a standard 18 volt lithium drill. Um, so it's, it's, they work best for early ice, late ice, when it's a little bit thinner, but you can also use them if you're whole hopping a lot, if you're just drilling a lot, pull here, hold there, and trying to find, trying to find fish. Um, the ion, for instance, though, that green, the green one over there, that one is actually a bigger auger. It's about the same size as, a standard, as your standard size auger. That one's meant to be drilling a lot of holes. Um, but, but the problem with that one is that the unit itself costs it, it you about anywhere from 150 to 500 bucks for any of these models, but that one's a little higher in the end. But the battery plate, the ratchet placement itself is about 50 bucks for the battery. That one's a little bit spendier, but a lot of guys really like it. It cuts pretty easily, and it's a uh, you don't, have to make, you don't have to do any mixing or fuel right now for those, but I so said if you want to, you can sample this any time. It says only about 12 pounds. And, the, and uh, this, this, this last time this was charged, it drilled over it drilled on hard holes. Uh, my friend let me borrow it. He said he drilled on hard holes with it before I had to charge the battery. So these are a nice little, nice new, new toy for the seal that came out. So of course, your standard gas auger. Usually, the ones you, one you, one you hear on the ice, the ones you see on the ice, typically those are going to be your gas loggers. They're the loudest ones, and they also require you know, either your fuel or a fuel, a fuel uh, oil mix, which, uh, generally speaking, most of them are a fuel oil mix. That's why most of you buy a, a four-stroke one, but those are a bit more expensive. Uh, best for drilling lots of holes. Um, usually, if I'm going to perch, I'm drilling 50 to 60 holes over a very wide distance to just, just try and find it, just to follow the schools around. And uh, right now, with the ice as thick as it is, it's nice to have the gas because it does it does operate at colder temperatures uh, very well. Uh, unfortunately, it is the they are the heaviest models. This particular one weighs 32 pounds compared to the nice 12 pound uh, clam or two pound conversion here. Um, and they're also the most awesome, expensive. You're looking at you're looking at spending about 300 600 bucks if you uh, go the gas route. Just depends on the brand you want, whether it's you know, Strike Master, Jiffy. Clam, HD, or Eskimo. Um, so, and the, the one on the lower left-hand side there, that's one of the newer Strike Masters. That was one, that was one of their four-strokes. That one does not require the gas oil mix, which is, which is kind of what a lot of guys really like. And it's very quiet. It's, a lot quiet. it's not quite, it's not as quiet as this, but it's a lot quieter than the gas auger, the regular gas augers. And your, your rods and reels. What, what size is that one there? This is, a, this is a six inch. This one comes standard with a six inch blade. Uh, they think next year they make more of an eight-inch model, but uh, that's an eight-inch gas. Yeah. This this is an eight-inch gas yeah, here. Yeah, uh, I've seen. You know, I've I've hauled a, a ten-inch auger. If you decide to go that route for bigger fish like you know pike, lake trout, walleye, it's uh, usually they're a few pounds heavier than the eight inches, but they still use the same you know same engine. And there's a, there, there's a lot of different rods and reels out there. If you've ever been by the stores in like Bell Shields, the Rooster. So there's a lot of different uh, prices, anywhere from 15 up to 100 bucks, depending on how nice how nice of rods you want to get. Um, like most of most of my rods over there, a couple of them, um, you know, they were there. I bought them at the store, a couple of combo kits, they're about 30 bucks. And the rest of them are uh, especially made ones because I've kind of gotten into the custom made stuff. They're a little bit more expensive. Um, species specific rods, you got you know with your various links and actions. You can get uh, you know, your ultralights for lights for like panfish and trout, your mediums, medium lights for you know, beer trout and walleye, and your heavies for like lake trout and pike, uh, depending on whatever kind of fishing you want to do. Uh, tip ups are also a very affordable option if you're looking at kind of getting started. Uh, they usually range anywhere from about $10 to $20 for most of your tip ups. It's a good way to fish for a walleye or walleye northerns. Those models I have there are actually rigged up so they, so they can, so a perch can actually bite those. It's a newer, 
newer one that came out this year for like 10 bucks. But uh, it works well for, for like for smaller fish. Because I, I usually, I'm a, I'm a pan, I like to fish with pan fish the most. I like my perch, bluegills, crappie. Those ones I like best. But I do fish for walleye, trout again, and bigger trout occasionally. And you want to choose your combo based on what you plan on fishing for. If you're going to go for, if you're going for walleye, for instance, you don't buy an ultralight. If you, if you get into a big walleye or a northern, it's going to snap it like a, like a, like a dry pool. Um, so you want to kind of pick your, pick your rod, pick your rod combo according to what uh, species you're going to be fishing for. And there's various different, you know, brands that you can get. You can pick up anything at like the Bellas, Northland, 13 Fishing, uh, Fraybill, Plano, Jason Mitchell series. They all make a good, good combo for you for, you know, for a pretty good price. We got some different setups here. Um, we got, we got the Northland Ma that comes with uh, some jigs to start out with. That's kind of a nice little deal that uh, you, can, you can get some jigs for what uh, happened to have to pay extra for them. Uh, the one on the far right, that is the Frayville Jiggler. It's uh, about a four foot long rod. It's meant for sta being standing up and uh, going for bait, going for panfish. Because it's got a little spring barber at the end. Um, it's, uh, but the line is entirely encased in the rod. There's no wind that you have to put up with moving your line around. A lot of guys, I've seen a lot of guys go for bluegills down the stockade. They like to, I've seen these guys using that, they just go to the shallow water, and they're just they're standing like this in the kitchen, they just raise up their hand, and there's a fish. It's kind of handy for, it's kind of handy for that. We get some other models here. Uh, inline reels have kind of caught, have kind of caught a lot of uh, steam the last couple of years. The nice thing about them is that uh, spinning reels tend to twist your line a bit when you're reeling. But with inline reels, it keeps the line from twisting, so your bait's not doing this under the water. Which, if you're going for panfish, for instance, uh, if it's doing this, they're not going to bite. Um, I, I use one. I use one of those right now myself. Uh, this one. This is a needle needle calling line reel. Works really nice. This one here has a nice feature where you push the button here, and the line comes out automatically. You don't have to sit there like a little fly reel where you have to pull the line. Uh, that one, I think the reel is only about uh, twenty-five bucks, just for the just for the reel. Um, those came out last year, and they were one of the hotter items uh, last year's. Uh, either last year, this this year you can find them at uh, Cabela's and Shields. I've seen some of this year. The rooster carries some combos, for like thirty, thirty-five bucks, to have a rod along with that particular reel. But uh, it's really nice for jigging for jigging for perch and bluegills for sure, because. Uh, and it reels, it reels up a lot faster as well. It needs a little two feet of line compared to a few inches on your spinning reels. And you got some different, different tip ups. You got your standard you know, tip up there, your round ones that keep the hole insulated. Um, those, are, those are really nice if you're on a fish on a windy day because uh, the snow will blow into your hole and that will affect uh, your flag and the line and whatnot. But those insulated ones are pretty nice to keep the snow out. Next thing is your, is your tightest tackle. The biggest thing you remember there is, is that uh, if you want, what are you going to be targeting? And there's so much ice tackle now compared to about 10 years ago. Um, you can walk into stores right, in, right before, and uh, there's just so much out there right now because different companies want to make a different, different lure, the different they get lure for the year, and there's always there's like new models every year. Um, the lures you buy just depends on which one fish for. Smaller jigs and, and spoons, you want to use those for your panfish and your, and your rainbow trout, brown trout around this area. Uh, bigger spoons and jigs for, for your walleye, your northern, and your lake trout um, around here. And uh, it's always best just to have an assortment. Uh, never buy just one of the same color, of the one color, because if you lose that jig, um, then you have to go buy another one anyway. So I've learned that rule a few times. Never buy, never buy just one of them of the same color. And then there's, and that's just a handful of different brands available. There's a lot nowadays that uh, buy the lures from now. This is just a, different, a little bit of an assortment of some of the newer lures that have come out the last couple of years. Um, you've got uh, some, of, some of the new clam ones. You've got like the, uh, the tungsten one here, that's the dingle drop. You've got the bomb spoon, blade spoon. That's, that's, uh, those, are, those are for your perch and your wallet. I've got a few of those uh, on display there. Uh, Rapala makes, the Ripper Map here makes it as a great lure for catching walleye because it's extremely loud and rattle bait, as well as the as the Jiggy spoon. And then of course you got your Northland uh, down here, they make a lot of different ice jigs. Uh, Hexi Fly, Macho Minnow, and then Lindy makes an assortment of jigs and uh, 
these things as well. But everybody, everybody, most people who fish for perch around here know about the Haley's lure. Uh, it's kind of been the lure, the lure around here for the last few years that catches the perch. Um, there's also, and so if you are burning playing over perch or any kind of panfish, it's always a good idea to have a few of those in your tackle box for sure. And you can find those that used to be just the rooster carried them, but now you can find them at the Shields and Cabela's. And they're not bad price either what they are. They, they are kind of they're, they're the in lure of the last few years for perch for sure. Would you point it out again? Yeah, yeah. it's the uh, blue one. Uh, oh, okay. it's all here. Yeah. You might need a new battery. <laughs> yeah, I need a new battery. Flashers. Now, the rest, uh, the rest of the next, next few slides are going to cover kind of, kind of some of the more uh, expensive, invest, exp expensive investments, I have to call them. Uh, but if you, if you do get a flasher, if you don't already have one, it's, you, it's a nine day difference between fishing with and without one. Um, I did it for the longest time when I was younger without a flasher. As soon as I got a hold of a flasher, it's, uh, I can't leave home without it when you always fishing. I will turn around and come back and grab it. The two or three times I have forgotten to bring it. I won't come back for my for, for a bait, I won't come back for some of my lures, but I will turn around and come back for the flashers because when you can see your jig and see the fish coming up to you and how they're reacting to you, it uh, totally changes the game when you're always fishing. And you will be able to you'll be surprised how more fish you're going to catch when you can actually see the fish and how and watch it come up to your jig or your lure. Um, and like I said, they're an investment for years because of their expense. They do range anywhere from 200 to 1200 to 1200 bucks, uh, depending on the brand and the features um, that, you're looking, that you want to look at. There are different brands of Vexilar, which is, probably most, which is one of the most popular ones in the entire country, especially in the northern uh, states here. Uh, Hummingbird, which I use, uh, makes a good model. Markham and Lorentz also make uh, so, so on our flasher uh, combo. And that's some of your different three different models here. You got the uh, uh, Marco makes uh, makes uh, some different some different models. You got this one here. That's an LX7. It's a digital. It's a digital uh, one. They're kind of more of a box shape compared to the circular shape that most of them. I don't fit as well in five gallon buckets, which is kind of what some people are kind of trying off with them. But they're a good, uh, good unit. Uh, the market also makes this one called Showdown. It's a vertical flasher as opposed to the round one. Um, that one's really good. It's a really good one for beginners. You've never used a flasher before. It, uh, you see your bait going up and down instead of kind of on, instead of on here, where your bait kind of follows the circle here, and you'll see fish coming up. You know, very, it's, it's like looking at an actual boat sonar. Um, so it's really a handy. It's really a nice way, a nice beginner. Got uh, Vexilar, that's like that's the most popular one around here. Most guys who I see on ice, so they all have those. Um, then you got your Hummingbird, which I like because it has a digital, a digital, a digital a depth gauge. So instead of having to figure out your depth like you have to on a standard Vexilar screen, it actually will show you on the uh, screen there what your depth is. So you don't have to figure out your depth, and does that automatically, which is very nice, which I like about it. And then the shelters. Do you actually need them? Um, they are, they are uh, again, one of the biggest expenses that you can make while ice fishing. Um, you need to, determining to buy one is a decision that needs to be thought through and researched. Because if you are going to buy one, you have to decide are you going to be mobile and move around, or are you going to stay in one place for the most part and stay in one fish in one spot? Uh, that's where you know, these two different versions here come in. You've got your standard hub and your, your, your flip over side with the, with the, with the shelter here. Sometimes a five-gallon bucket's all you need um, to fish. That's why I use with. That's why I use for a few years. It's just that, because especially if you're not playing ice fishing very often, or if you're only playing a couple hours a day, or if you only go out on nicer days, you know you don't have to spend the money. That's what you're going to plan. That's what you're going to do with your ice fishing for the most part. And some of your different models, or different brands there. There's three different types that I classify. There's your standard wind blocker, <coughs> the hub style, and the flip over sled. The prices range from about $110 to $1,200. And some different types. <coughs> You've got uh, your hub styles. 
You flip over, so they're really afraid of all the time. Uh, otter makes a very heavy duty uh, shelter. They're probably the thickest material that they're made out of and the thickest bars compared to the other brands. And then Chappelle makes the, kind of the same ones, but they also have this one here. It's just a, uh, it's a, it's a wind blocker. It's just a seat, and you just pull it over your head, and that's what it is. Uh, my dad actually uses that, he really likes it for just getting, it's just, just getting rid of the wind for the most part. But that's a good starter, one, two, for like, kind of getting into, into shelters. Underwater cameras. They've really gained popularity a lot the last few years because they've gotten smaller, and the screens have gotten a lot better as far as their resolution and the color. Uh, it's hard to find a black and white anymore these days because everybody's going to color. And they're very useful in identifying vegetation on the ice or seeing exactly what the fish are doing and how they're exactly how they're responding to your uh, presentation. <coughs> Green vegetation is always an indication of oxygenated water because that's where the fish will they'll concentrate in those areas with green weeds. So if you can find green plants under the water if you're using a camera, it's a good spot to stick around with and try and see if there's anything around. Uh, the prices start around $200, $250, um, depending on if they're on sale or not. Brands, you got your Aquaview Mark from Bexar, kind of standard. Your standard ones are this one here I'm using is a uh, Aquaview uh, Micro. Um, and that's just this nice bit. It's, it's a lot smaller, fits in the pockets, a little bigger than the cell phone. And uh, it's, uh, it, works, it works very well. I use that to see what's uh, below me. That's not, that's not biting, so. I'm going to show a little video here. I'm trying to see what it looks like when you're actually when you're using it. But uh, see, a good example of, of, uh, use of a use of one was a few weeks ago when I was fishing in Sheridan. I, uh, <coughs> I, had a lot of, I had a lot of fish activity on my, on my flasher screen, but I couldn't get anything to bite because I was fishing, I was fishing for, trying to find some, I was trying to find the rainbows for your trout. And uh, I had a lot of activity down there, nothing to bite. So I put my the, the camera down there, and it was a big old school of crappie. So I brought my lure back up, and I switched to something else, and I caught some crappie, and I thought I was using that. So that was a good way of using of using the combination of a flash or any camera, because the, the flash will find you fish, but sometimes the camera is nice to show you kind of what is actually below there, so you can actually uh, switch up your presentation if the uh, how big were you doing this? This this is actually a video on YouTube. I didn't actually take this one. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've used I've used this thing in 30 feet of water, and it's worked just fine. It, just, it depends a lot on the clarity and the light um, for that one. But uh, yes, yeah, so like Sharon Lake, for instance, most of the lakes around here in the hills are pretty clear. You can generally see a good distance uh, underwater with a, with a camera. Um, I mean, for instance, most of these, most of these cameras will, will work you know, if you decide to go that route with an underwater camera. But it's a good, it's a nice to have every once in a while when you're out there. <coughs> Here's some of your different uh, types of cameras. This is the uh, the new model of Aquaview Micro. This is the yellow one. It's got a little bit higher resolution than, than mine's got. Uh, the, the bigger screen one here, another Aquaview. And of course, Markham. It's uh, just a camera view. And this is actually their LX9. It's a sonar uh, camera combo. That one will run you $1,100. A little spin. And then the uh, Bexlar makes a uh, makes pretty good a pretty camera too. But you got the gear, and now we're now where do you go with it? Now, most of the lakes around here offer great ice fishing. Uh, it just depends on you know the lake you want to go to and the spe species of fish in there. Uh, the most popular lakes tend to be Sheridan, Deerfield, Pectola, Orin. Although Orin right now is the ice is kind of shifting. Which we'll recommend, go, we'll recommend going on. Uh, But smaller lakes also are nice. Uh, Stockade, Bismarck, Robay, Center, Silver Lake um, are really good. Uh, I'm actually uh, Robay and Silver are actually two of my favorite ones to go to for, for trout. Because you can usually go there and the trout, I mean, they're not hit very often, so they're pretty, they're pretty pristine once in the, during, during the season, just because nobody really goes to them. Everybody concentrates on the bigger lakes. But uh, most of the time I go to these those places, there's never anybody out there. It's a nice place to go for some, some peace and quiet and some, some good trout fishing. Um, so what species you want to target depends on 
It just depends where you want to go and also what, how, what bait you want to buy. Uh, most of the time, if you're fishing for panfish and trout, you're going to be use, using maggots or, or wax worms. Um, I myself use the, I buy the red, uh, red uh, maggots from the rooster. That seems to be the color that, uh, that most of the fish, that most of the panfish like. Um, it's always best to check on the ice, the ice fishing reports before you go out. Uh, the journal has a nice bit as a fishing report every Thursday in there. So that's always a good place to find out the, uh, where the hot bite is at around the hills here. And the rooster bait shop below Grape is a really good place to use for ice conditions and fishing reports. Those guys are usually, usually really good about you know, getting information and sharing with, them, sharing with anybody who asks. So I always recommend using them as a resource if you are looking for reports. Once you've picked out where you want to go, you know, or you want to know where you will try to fish on the lake. Human Fish offers a really has a really, really good link on their website. Uh, they have a lot of different uh, lakes, especially here in the hills, so that you can you can print off the lakes. They have they're all they all they're all contoured, um, which is nice. You don't spend a hundred bucks, you know, on on carting down those chips and stuff to get that. But uh, majority of lakes around here, like I fish Deerfield, Sylvan. So I've got all the lakes and I broke them down. I split, I split some of the lakes in half just to get some closer ups of some of the different uh, points and areas uh, where you would want to fish at. So that's a good, uh, good resource to use. And then when you're, when you're looking at those, you want, you want to key on uh, points and basins. Generally, that's where the best places to find fish or where they'll tend to concentrate. <coughs> and look for areas where the, where the water drops pretty quick. Like, yeah, that's always good. Fish like to hang out kind of on the, where those edges are. And uh, that's when they get the link of the website there. It takes you to, take you to the, uh, where you can get those printed off. I said, beats, uh, beats spending, you know, paying 100 bucks for a GPS or over 200 bucks for a GPS and buying those chips for another 100 bucks. So it's a good resource to use for, for no money at all. And, we, and uh, I like to practice, I, I practice selective harvest. Um, if you catch a big one, what should you do with it? Should you keep it or let it go? And really, it's up to you. It's, uh, if you want, you can keep as many fish as you want within the legal limit, and uh, that's you know, that's fine. That's your that's, the, that's your choice. There's no problem there. Um, conservation groups, local anglers like to encourage you to keep some fish, but the bigger ones we uh, we like we, we like to see them let go because those are the fish that uh, have the strongest. Those ones that live the longest, they've got the strongest genes. And you like to keep those genes in the pool, to keep, the, to keep them breeding those into the population for stronger, healthier fish. You know, if you, if you go out to Sheridan, you, get, you, you, you keep all the eight, eight, nine, ten inch fish you want, but you catch a 13 or 14 inch fish, take some pictures with it, and uh, if you want to keep it, go ahead, but we encourage, we like to say, you know, let it go. We can keep that one in the water for, for future fish. It's important that we try to preserve fishing for future, for the future by practicing this to keep our Fishing population is healthy and abundant. Um, I'm a member of uh, Recycled Fish. It's a nonprofit group that preaches uh, selective harvest, catch and release. And, um, it's you know you can you can go on their website, and see what you can do. It's, it's sometimes it's just a matter of cleaning up like your, after yourself, you clean up your garbage, any extra fishing line left out, clean up the rabbit, little things like that uh, are what they're all about. You know, it's besides besides the selective harvest, but it keeps the waters and healthy. Appreciating those kind of things, so I would uh, definitely encourage anyone who is interested in being, in being an ambassador uh, to go there because it doesn't, it doesn't cost anything. It's, it's a really nice, it's a really nice deal. Most importantly, with your ice fishing, is just have fun. Um, like I said that's, I got into it five years ago. So I look forward to it more than open water. Um, it's just a, it's, it's a great time. Even if it should be my by myself. You know, you're out there, it's in the air is crisp, and you, it's like you're one-on-one you're one -on -one with the fish. You know, it's a great, it's a great experience in my opinion. Um, most of you probably know, you know, that last year, the state record Laker was caught. Um, so and sometimes I get into a fish like that. One of these days I hope I will get into a fish like that, and, uh, and it will be a lot of fun. But uh, it's always, it's always fun, it's always, it's always best with a group, but if you, want, if you really get into it, you really love it. It's uh, really tough to keep you from getting out there once you're there. If you need any more information, uh, there's a lot of great resources that are available available around around here. 
or online. You can join online forums like Hotspot Outdoors. Uh, it's a great, uh, a great forum to be on. I, you'd be, I've learned so much being on the website over the last year. Um, just different techniques, different uh, areas to fish. I mean, it's not just here, it's Minnesota, Wisconsin, and whatnot, but uh, you pick up a lot of different ideas there. Uh, join, join groups online like Clams Ice Team. It's free. <coughs> You can you'll get you get all kinds of advice from their from their pro staff. Um, one day I'll be I'll be able to get advice on that website. Um, uh, but uh, it's a, that's a good one just to give it gives you ideas for gear, way different ways to fish, different techniques. Um, and then other groups like Ice Hogs Anonymous here in town. Uh, the gentleman here he started this group. It's pretty it's a, it's growing it's about about two thousand followers now on Facebook. It's a, a handy little site to also be part of because it's local. Craig, the guy who, who started the group, he's a, uh, we're always trying to grow, grow, grow the membership of the group. And I said, that was not cost anything, it was just a matter of like being on Facebook. And uh, I said, so there's a lot of other groups out there online, you know, either on Facebook or other different websites, you can pick and choose kind of, but uh, these are great resources to take advantage of. And I uh, can't say enough about getting on them because you'd be surprised how much you're going to learn uh, being a part of that. Otherwise, any more any other questions? Okay. Before you uh, bought the high tech stuff, how did you know how to do a fish? Well, the old, the old tried true method was um, I took a I had, I took a hook on my lure, I put a weight on it, and mm -hmm. dropped it to the bottom. Right. Well, and then what? Do you not reel back up again? No. I mean, then, well, actually, no. Uh, I wouldn't reel back. You know, uh, I would. Uh, I pull it up about six inches and kind of. Mark it with my finger, and I pull up the rest, and that's where I would. Uh, and then when I put the, put the lure back on and put it down, that's where I, I usually just bobber fished yeah. when I was younger. So that's what we would do. We just we put the bobber about six inches from where we pulled it up, and that was how we fished. When I try that, either the wind or the line on itself on its own somehow ties itself into a giant knot. Yeah, that happens. That happens with, especially with mono. Um, I don't use mono very often, except for some of my uh, spoon rigs. Um, I, I like to use uh, like fluorocarbon for the most part. It's, it's a little, it's, it doesn't twist as bad. It's invisible in the water, especially with my panfish lines. Like most of my uh, or most of my junior rods here have all got fluorocarbon on. These about it's about three about three or four pounds as well. I'm fishing I'm fishing with panfish now for lake trout, um, but uh, that'll, that'll help that problem if you uh, have that line twist or just replace your replace your line with some mono and that would help that would help out too. Usually once mono hits about six months old. It's uh, usually it usually it usually starts getting all twisted up and down. It's pretty bad. This rod will be left over here. This one? That's the heaviest one you have, isn't it? Uh, yes, that actually is. This is one of the. Uh, this is one of my, this is one of my uh, special one of my special rods that uh, they make for they make for ice hawks around this. And uh, yeah, this is a this is a medium heavy. This was designed for uh, lake trout and walleye fishing. I only had a couple of those. Most of my rods, I usually fish with panfish, like I said, so most of my rods are ultralights or medium lights, like some of my jigging rods here for trout. Uh, this was a, this is a little bit different kind of rod too, because it's longer than your standard ice fishing rod. Uh, my, uh, my, my dad actually got this for me from a, from a store in Oldridge uh, after the ice fishing tournament there a couple years ago. It's uh, handy for standing standing up or if you're kind of sitting down, you can get a little ways from your hole. But uh, that's a, another medium light rod. What is your jigging technique? Well, is, uh, this is, who else, is, is anybody here usually jig for perch or any kind of panfish? Because um, usually the, uh, you know, the technique that I usually use is um, if I have a jig on with either a plastic or a, or a, or a wax worm or a maggot, I like to, stick it as, I like to get it down there. Usually I just uh, kind of go with it really fast just to get, just to get that uh, movement going on either the bait. Or the, or the maggot, and um, so you, you can pretty much do any kind of technique you like. I mean, a lot of guys like to do this. You'd be surprised how many fish you get just by sitting there shaking it a little bit like that. Just, just get the just get the bait to quiver a little bit. You'd be surprised how many fish will shoot up to your lure when they see that. So I always like to use use the, use the jiggle method, I guess that's what I call it. But that's a good good method for catching catching hand fish. Most of your, your time you're fishing for walleye, you're going to run into uh, you're, you're, you're jigging up, and they're going to hit it as they're you're 
Well, this one is this is an Arctic Warrior. It uh, works. Your once you set it up, when the fish pulls, it pulls its flag down, the flag pops up, and then usually you've got your drake either really loose or you've got it open, and you just kind of twist the line around where you put this hook in. There's a little uh, little niche back where you can put this flag. So when the fish take it, just you, know, you can rig it. If you put the when you go when you or you rig up your the straps here. A little bit further, you can go for sensitive or heavier if you're fishing for something bigger. So you're fishing for like walleye, you know, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of action, it'll pop. But uh, this is this, this also you can, you can also find this in most other stores too. It's a nice little setup for for wall for walleye fishing. Our, our lake trout. I see, I see this a lot on back to when guys are our lake trout fishing. Pretty much fish from the bottom. Usually, or? yeah. I mean, about the only thing I catch that's not within three feet of the bottom is usually trout. And I know a lot of, a lot of you know, those, the guys from northern fish, they tend to fish not very far into the ice, especially in shallower water. Because the, the northern aren't really hanging at the bottom, they're kind of suspended or closer to the, or the bottom of the ice. That's where a lot of usually fish from northern. You say a lot of times you're going by yourself. Well, I usually, I take my out, you know. I got to well, see. One more home, so ten, ten rods. Um, I should love this one. Um, I usually take. I usually fill this, this bucket here. It's got got a uh, rod, little foam rod holder in it. I'll take out six. <coughs> I got three, you know, three three jigging spoons or three jigging rods, three spoon rods, and I've got different different lures on on all of them, so I can so I can switch out quick. Especially if you're you know if you got a school of perch or bluegills below you, they don't want to bite. It's easier just to. You know, Roll this one here, grab this one, and it down, and it's a lot faster. So yeah, usually about about six rounds. If I'm a walleye fishing, I just bring out a couple. Just bring out usually this one, that, and this one this year. Like I like the, like I like rainbow and green fish. That's my favorite fish to catch the ice. Do you use much minnows? <clears throat> uh, just for walleye. Um, every every once in a while, I'm out shared in. I uh, throw I'll throw out. Uh, one of, the, one of these, I'll, I'll put a minnow on it, um, or I'll just use a uh, one of those like you know, little, little rod holders, like, like two or three dollar, those two or three dollar rod holders that you can buy. I'll just put like, uh, you know, for instance, this one here. This has a just has a you know, nice colorful lure. Put a, put a minnow on this one, just put it down there, just let the fish come to it. <coughs> How do you hook your minnow? Inside? Typically, you want you want to go through just uh, just the just where the dorsal where the dorsal fin's at. You want to hook that just underneath, just underneath that, through that. You don't, you don't want to kill the fish. Yeah. You want it to still be alive and it's swimming around to attract, uh, attract, attract the fish. But uh, you, know, you don't want if you go too deep, you're going to penetrate organs. It's going to die faster. So yeah, just 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 underneath that dorsal fin is a good spot to go because the fish will stay alive for a while. Right in front of it, or is that right in front of it, or wherever you, wherever it will be nice and even. You know, wherever you're, usually it's like I usually put like right to. Usually your fish is kind of going to be like pretty much straight, or maybe just tilt a little down. As long as it is, as long as your fish is like hanging like this, uh, you're usually okay. Well, yeah, this, uh, these, uh, these, these, are, these just go in here, and then we'll tap them here. So I'll, I'll throw this in the, in the sled there, and uh, that, these, this, this, uh, this just goes in the pot in my pockets. It's here. You just have multiple of each one. Yeah. Yeah, see, mostly, see, you don't see a whole lot of, you know, like I said, this, of the, well, just one of the one color, just because of the rule that uh, I've learned hard, hard time at times. But these little things are handy because you can hold, you know, hold little spoons, you can hold lots of jigs. So you got some options. You know, you're out there, switch out quick while you're, while you're fishing. What colors are you finding work best? Best color is usually fire tiger and uh, red. This this year, this year, especially with the tournament, I, I noticed that the red color jig uh, seemed to really work. 
in stained water, if you know, if you, if you can tell, when you're, if you're drilling through the hole and the water is clear, gold, always, always, a, always, a, always a good standby um, to use. But yeah, for actually, yeah, fire tiger kind of is one of my favorite patterns, and then the super red was a was a real popular one. Okay. Drive on the ice yourself? Do I drive on the ice? Um, I did for the tournament because <clears throat> the ice was ice Sheridan as of as of uh, last week was about this thick, plenty plenty thick for the truck. I just have a little 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 ranger, so I'm not too terribly worried. But I typically I still prefer to walk if possible. I don't have a four wheeler yet. Um, but, uh, His wife gets nervous and yells at him. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I usually I usually walk. That's why I like to. That's why I like this, like the smaller lakes. They're easy. You just walk. You can walk across those in just a few minutes. They're pretty nice. So otherwise, uh, I'm at Sheridan. I always park at places where I can where I know I can fish at. I'm fishing over in the deeper water. I fish at the south marina. I just walk. It's just easier that way. I feel a lot, a lot better. <laughs> Despite the recommendation of uh, 15 inches for 12, 15 inches for pickup, I like two feet. I feel a lot safer. I see two pictures of two pictures of vehicles in the water. First one we have is a fifteen dollar card. Everybody put their name in here. Who's using it? Actually, I don't have mine in there, but that's okay. You sure? Yeah. Okay. okay. I got plenty of. Uh... That increases everybody else's chance. <laughs> Brian. All right. Mm -hmm. There you go. There's still, there's still some jigs left at over there if you need if you need anything. <laughs> Yeah, if, if, if you go to, if, I will tell you, if you go to Shields, Shields or Cabell's right now, they're really getting low on in inventory because ice fishing season, they only bring in stuff for a certain amount of time, and after that, nothing. Uh, so, you know, if you're planning on getting some stuff uh, from there, uh, now, would be, now would be the time for sure. Otherwise, the Rooster's got a pretty good, so, uh, pretty good selection still. And for the $25 gift card, Dennis. Questions, or if you just want to look around some of the stuff, feel free to put your hands on stuff and try it out. Thank you. You can even uh, come here and try out this. <laughs> Actually, I'll go look at your maps. Go ahead. And then look at the one that's the least I have in there are the ones I usually, yeah. usually fish. So. And hopefully, you have your secret hot spot. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've pretty much always shared this one that's marked with now. Uh, for that tournament that's in the of January every year, mm -hmm. I always this one here is getting old. It's about, about this. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, placement for the auger. And whatever you want. It has to be an 18 volt. That's what I'm going to do. Most of the guys use these liquids. It lasts a lot longer. Yeah, it's nice and light. 12 pounds. Yeah, so you drill a hundred holes before you have to charge it. I'm buying that next year. This is, this is on my professional case for it. Three minutes. Okay, I'm already on the phone. I'm pulling the sled out with me and have this in there. That's already on the phone. For one case. This is 70 pounds. It's going to be rod holders out there. Yeah. It's going to be rod holders out there. Yeah. It's going to be rod holders out there. Yeah. This is next to me. It's five hundred bucks. It makes it a lot easier. It keeps most of your stuff you know, apart from each other. So. Yeah, exactly. That's why, that's why I bought it. Less than less time for sure. What kind of line did you say? Well, on, my, on the jigging line, I use four, or three or four pound fluorocarbon because I'm just switching pan fish. I mean, this, this one here has got.